Yes. Yeah. 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 Because last time I was cut off, right, and, and, I, and I have a, okay, so I will be happy to occupy the time. All right. <clears throat> okay, so um, what we're going to discuss now is um, structure illumination microscopy. Okay, so it is um, um, an approach that's fluorescence microscopy, and I will describe how it is related. Uh, and, and so I'm going to give an introduction to structural illumination microscopy, image formation models for structural illumination microscopy, or SIM. Uh, the resolution improvement that we get because of this approach, and also, in addition, uh, we can get more resolution improvement by doing involution. And I will uh, give you a, 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 some discussion of our current methodology, which is uh, modeling a uh, sin in the presence of spherical aberrations. And this is something that uh, is work in progress right now. Um, okay, yes, I was wondering, I, I had done that, uh, and, and, you know, sometime, and I just apologize. This is the same information, but bigger, so. Um, so I, in, in terms of the press, in seeing the press of spherical aberration, I'll show you some simulations and uh, measured images, and I'll compare uh, with uh, the results of the computational optical section in microscopy, which is the methodology that I discussed earlier. Okay. So what is structural illumination microscopy? Well, if you remember. Um, in, in my overview of computational imaging, I talked about um, this acronym, COSI, and uh, Professor Piasco, I'm sure, did as well, which is Computational Optical Sensing and Imaging, right? And this is an approach uh, that, um, in which the uh, system development uh, it integrates computations and optics uh, so that we can um, create or design a, a, an imaging system or a system that has superior performance. So this approach, in this approach there is a system modification in which there is an intermediate image, which is a characteristic of the quasi systems. And this intermediate image shows some grading lines, okay? Uh, superimpose with the underlying object. So these are called the raw grid images of SIM. Um, and then there is a computational method that was developed that integrates three of these raw images to yield this improved desired image down here of this cell which uh, it is a, an improved optical set, section and comparable to confocal microscopy, okay? And comparable to the COSM approach that I was discussing earlier. So what, what makes this work, okay? Uh, and what, just to put this in perspective, there are, two approaches to do computational optical sectioning with wide field microscopy. So one approach is the one on the right that I just discussed, the COSM. Okay, so we have to collect a, a series of images to cover the a desired volume, and then we do processing in 3D over the volume uh, with knowledge of the points per function, three-dimensional points per function, multiple points per functions, what have you, to get the final 3D image. Now, with structure illumination microscopy, same fluorescence microscopy, the slight modification that I'm going to describe, we get, for every focal depth, we get three images. You, you don't really, they don't really show, but there are three images here. 
these three images are now integrated with computations to give uh, an improved optical section. So if you only want to see the best image in a depth of field or in a de in imaging depth, all you have to do is acquire these three images and you have the result, right? Whereas over here, if, if you want to see a single improved image, you have to get the whole volume and process the whole volume, right? So, um, let's, so that's um, the overview here, and, and I'll compare and contrast again. There is, um, Zeiss has commercialized this approach, the structural illumination microscopy, and they have a device called Apoton. And this device, you can see it here, uh, it gets inserted on the side here of the microscope. So you can have it there and you can slide it out and in to go from regular fluorescence microscopy to structural illumination microscopy. So it's really simple to do that, to do both. Okay, just you slide it out and in. Um, so what's in here, in this uh, uh, device, is a grid pattern, okay? And when you insert it there, uh, it goes right at the aperture diaphragm. So this is the illumination, right? So it goes into the illumination path, and because uh, this diaphragm, everything that's um, <coughs> indicated here in red represents conjugate planes in the microscope. And conjugate planes are viewed uh, superimposed on top of one another when you're looking through the microscope. So this aperture then, uh, if you put the grid there, when you're focusing on a sample, you see whatever the grid pattern is in focus at that focal plane or at least it's projected. We'll look at the modeling and see that it actually, you know, there's, since it's an imaging process, you actually have some um, blurring of that grid. But for now, let's just assume that you get the grid pattern completely projected only on the focal plane. So uh, if you take everything out from the microscope here, right, you just have the dichroic mirror here, and here's the device that has the grid pattern and the illumination, and so it comes down through the lens and it's projecting the grid, you see here, onto the sample, and so this intermediate or raw image will again show uh, the sample and the grid pattern. This is an approach that was presented in 1997 by Tony Wilson's group, and uh, it's a simple method, I mean conceptually, and a, and a very um, interesting method that is based on modulation, okay? Because the grid pattern can be represented by a sinusoid of a certain frequency omega, and what's happening here is that we can change the phase of the sinusoid, and what um, they have shown is that if you take e equally spaced um, phases at, at 0, 120, and uh, minus 120, or 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3 uh, for the phase, then you can develop, or they develop, a simple uh, computational method, right, that takes these three images, so you can create three images by varying the phase, right, of your green pattern, and then you have I1, I2, I3, and you can take respective differences between these images, square it, and take the square root, weigh it by the scalar, and you get a new image that looks like this. Right? So why does this work this way? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, switch out for a few minutes to my uh, few slides from my lecture that I give to my undergraduate students in uh, signals and systems that the sinusoidal amplitude modulation, okay, just 
some of you know it and, and some of you may not. But <clears throat> so this is the technique that's uh, being used in communication uh, systems, right? To uh, in, in radio, television, uh, to modulate um, a signal um, by multiplying. This is a signal in time, uh, and, and it's in one D here. But this, you know, you can scale it up to uh, two dimensions for an image, three dimensions. And so, if you multiply or modulate a function by a complex uh, exponential and I'm in electrical engineering, so we use J, right, not I. I is current for us. Um, then the Fourier transform of this modulated signal will um, exhibit a shift in frequency space. So if the original signal X of T has a Fourier transform X of omega, so uh, Raphael Piesson defined the Fourier transform the other day, um, then once I multiply x of t with a sinusoid, right, uh, then uh, the question is what is now the frequency representation of this signal, okay? So if I look at x of t times the cosine, because cosine can be written in terms of two complex exponentials, right, I can um, decompose this in this form and ask the question, what is now the Fourier transform of y of t, okay? So there are different ways you can think about that, but basically uh, the modulation or the multiplication of two signals in the time domain or space domain becomes a convolution in the frequency domain. Uh, and the Fourier transform of a cosine is two shifted impulses, right, here. Um, so, Essentially, then, we're convolving that function, the triangular function, with the two shifted impulses that occur at the carrier frequency, omega sub c, of the sinusoid. And so what we're going to get back as a result is a replication of this Fourier transform centered at this minus omega sub c and omega sub c, right? So modulation or multiplication in the one domain, in frequency domain, gives us this um, Fourier transform. So it's shifted, moved out to different frequencies. So, okay, um, in, in structural illumination microscopy then, remember that the, we have the grid pattern, which is a sinusoid, um, superimposed on the specimen, right? So what the imaging lens sees, right, as a new object now, right, is a sinusoid times uh, the object, okay? So, um, so this is relevant, let's, uh, the, the modulation property, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to this for a minute, in a minute, but I, I I forgot that I have this slide here that demonstrates the how this instrument, if you compare it to conventional wide field, gives you improved uh, images. So this is what you see here <coughs> is are the raw images of this instrument, right? And the instrument doesn't actually show you the grid images, but here you know there is a way you can actually obtain them if you want to. So this is what it would look like because that grid pattern is shifting slightly to give you the three different phases. <coughs> and then those images are, uh, through the computations that I showed you in the previous slide, right, are used, the three different images that you see here shifting, are used to create these optical sections. So if you compare now these reconstructed sections, which is the result of the structural illumination microscopy, to this conventional white field, you see that um, you have the sample appearing in these two focal, the, the, the zero and then at the next focal plane, but then nothing afterwards, because over here, this is just the blurred uh, intensity, okay, in the conventional. Whereas over here, you have, you know, these images are darker because 
they uh, inherently have less out-of-focus light, right? So brighter light here doesn't mean better image necessarily. It just means that there is a lot of unspecific fluorescence or blurred fluorescence. Um, okay, so here's the slide that I was coming to. Um, remember with the modulation we are having this shift and what we're seeing here is in frequency domain our system where you see this dash line um, is band limited. So it will pass frequencies within this region, the shaded region, but it doesn't pass any frequencies outside of that. Right? It's in the microscope is band limited in frequency domain. So um, if your structure or object has frequencies outside that uh, two times F naught, they're not going to be image. So remember we talked about information loss the other day. So this is how a lot of the frequencies of a sample or an object are not being transmitted through the uh, system. The frequency transfer that it was discussed the other day characterizes the system. Now, with the modulation, okay, uh, we can um, move the frequencies of, so what you see here in, in these two peaks, right, um, are, let's say, uh, the um, frequency spectrum of the object, and, and some, in the conventional case, a lot of it would be lost. But if you use modulation, then you can fold these frequencies, shift them essentially back into the region um, where the microscope allows the frequency transfer, okay? So I talked about how I can shift this out, I can shift it in, you know. Basically by shifting, the modulating and picking the modulation frequency properly, I can shift this information that you see here that ordinarily would be lost, I can just shift it in there and now I'm able to image it, except I'm imaging it at the wrong place, right? So the image that I'm getting, it has the frequency content, but it's all encoded, right, in, in a different place. So the computations then, um, their job is to unscramble the frequency domain and give you the information because you have the information, okay? And this is what the name of the game is in COSI. We, we create intermediate images that have higher information content, uh, and then using the computations, we take that information and put it into meaningful places, right? Make sense? All right, so um, I hope that that gives you a sense of why that works. And pros and cons here, um, with uh, structured illumination, we get uh, true axial sectioning. And how much improve them in the resolution? It depends on the grid frequency. Okay, and I'll talk about that more specifically. Um, you have to take at least three images, right? Three, I described the simplest case where we have three grid images of three different faces, zero, minus, 120 degrees, and 120 degrees but you can actually even take more than just three. So this could be more time consuming in the data acquisition of a single imaging depth versus the wide field. In the wide field approach, you just take one image and click, 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 we change the depth. Um, versus confocal, uh, the structure illumination microscopy is on top of a wide field <coughs> microscope, no pinholes. So again, there is no light discarded here, as in confocal, so it's photon efficient. Uh, with respect to the resolution, uh, there are studies that show uh, you know, that you can surpass the resolution of the confocal depending on the instrument conditions and also what you're looking at. Um, there is no saturation limit uh, uh, here, and it's potentially faster. But it has a drawback of uh, having more noise and uh, reduced signal to noise ratio. Okay? So, um, this is now in frequency domain. Um, I don't recall um, 
was this structure introduced the other day? I think it might have been, not by me, by somebody else. Okay, so um, we're talking about frequency domain, right? And points per function is, is the representation of our system in space domain. And if you take the three-dimensional points per function and compute the three-dimensional Fourier transform of that, right, you get now uh, the response of the system in frequency domain, in a three-dimensional space, yes? <coughs> So, what we see here is a section of that three-dimensional volume in uh, two spatial frequencies, f sub x and f sub z. So, remember this volume here, if you Fourier transform, right, we, we do a transformation, we're going to get into a, a new three-dimensional space. And this is going to be now spatial frequency domain. <clears throat> and the axis is here. You would have a spatial frequency f sub z. So this goes along with z, but it's a spatial frequency. Here we have f sub y, and here we have f sub x. Okay? So the points per function, h, is a function of x, y, and z. And its Fourier transform capital H is a function of f sub x, f sub y, and f sub z. Okay? So, um, what we're seeing here is <clears throat> just a, a section image in the f sub x and f sub z, except that, uh, okay, so z, um, I put it in the wrong place, didn't I? <clears throat> f sub z is the vertical, and this is f sub y, okay? So what I'm showing you there is an image, it's a, an image in this plane, right? And it goes from both negative and positive f sub x. <clears throat> so this is the appearance of this um, function, and it's actually circularly symmetric. The Poisson functions are circularly symmetric. So this is circular symmetric too. Um, and so if you rotate this around f sub z, you will get a donut shape, right? That has like a, a, a hole in the middle. Think of a donut, but it's not completely a hole. It's just like a pin cushion, right, in the middle. All right, so, um, so this is how in frequency domain the wide field Optical transfer function is what it's called, right? Because it's the Fourier transform of the intensity uh, points per function. And the characteristics is, uh, are that it's band limited, so it's clearly after there's a maximum frequency here and around here and here, so if your object has frequencies outside that region, they're not going to be transferred by your system. And also there is this um, it's not just at the higher frequencies, so it's not just a low pass filter, but there's also clearly a lot of missing frequencies that are low frequencies, they're close to the origin. And this is what is called the missing cone of frequencies, because if you think about this thing in 3D, you have these two uh, regions that are conical, that there's no information going through. Now, with partial confocal microscopy, so if you have pinholes of certain size, you um, this shape of the <coughs> transfer function is as shown here by the dashed line. So you see that there's more frequencies that are being allowed, and this missing cone of frequencies is starting to fill up. Okay, and and with um, confocal actually, it's not shown here. The confocal would be the true confocal would be more like this. So there is no missing call, and that's why we get uh, improved resolution along uh, axially, okay? So in, white, in computational wide microscopy, we, we use the computations to fill up the missing cone of frequencies, right? With all those constraints that I talked the other day. With structure illumination microscopy, because we're doing the shifting of the frequencies, 
right? We're starting to have two replicas of this yellow bow tie, and so as they shift out, you're starting to fill out the space, right? And so depending what frequency you pick for the cosine that you're using to modulate, you can completely fill out the missing call, all right? But there is a limit, okay? So theoretically, there is no limit. So theoretically, this technique gives you unlimited resolution, okay? But uh, in principle, this doesn't work well because of the noise. So you cannot be greedy and, and say, okay, I'm gonna pick uh, a high grid frequency. Okay, what is, so we're talking about this cosine, right? That has this frequency here, omega. So omega is, uh, controls, remember I called it omega sub c, controls how far apart we shift the replication here, right? Uh, and so it, the practical limit is that omega can only be about 0.2, so I can achieve this much of a filling up. So there is a lot better than the white field, you see, and that's why you get improved resolution. Um, so this is the practical limit, and let's just, there were some discussions how you can uh, use different implementations to maybe uh, go further out. But you see here an image and in XY for conventional. So for conventional, you know, there is no cosine, so that's omega equals zero. And you see along Z that you get this spread, right, which is typical of a white field. So now if you put a grid with a frequency that's 0 0.06 of this cutoff fre frequency of the OTF, you're starting to get an improvement along Z. You see how the autofocus light is being diminished here and you get an improvement in your image. And then you increase the grid frequency of the cosine here and you get even better optical section here. Just compare it to all this uh, autofocus light being gone and the image becomes better. And you, great, you want to increase it further to spread this out better and have a uh, more fill up, but then what happens here? Starts to get noisy, okay? Because there is uh, a lot of noise out here that gets um, <clears throat> into the, you know, it's being now uh, included into the measurement, and it, um, it the noise increases faster than the signal, and so you get uh, poorer signal to noise ratio. So there is a practical limit. And because of that, um, it makes sense to uh, do some deconvolution on top of it, okay? Because this practical limit uh, is not uh, ideally um, de-blurred, but, but it's much better than wide field. Now, this, uh, um, because of this uh, uh, deterioration in the signal to noise ratio, these are images from my microscope using the apotome. This is a wide field image of the same sample and then this is using the structural illumination microscopy and you see the reduction of the, um, the signal. So I have, I don't know if you see these red arrows, I have these intensity profiles here. So this is uh, the um, intensity profile from the wide field. You see the counts go from zero to 1600 analog uh, units, uh, excuse me, analog to discrete units. And then over here is the profile through the apotome image, you see how noisy it is. The red one is from this image, and then in the apotome device you can average. And we, here's an average out of five frames, and the profile is the green one, so you get a reduction of the noise, but still very noisy, and you see that the uh, the, the units that we get from the camera, the range is up to 400 counts, so it's much smaller dynamic range. Uh, because remember, this methodology <clears throat> is based on subtracting images, right? So uh, you get a reduction in the, di in the range, in the dynamic range. These images look much better on the computer uh, than they do projected, but 
the idea is that you would appreciate that there is good optical sectioning in this image versus this image, except that you can't really see anything here. But anyway, maybe if I turn the laptop, you could see something, I'm not sure. Uh, it's different. Okay. <clears throat> Shown there. Um, okay, so returning to the modeling uh, aspects of this. Um, so this is a schematic that shows the placement. Uh, this is your, the regular fluorescence microscope, the dichroic here, illumination. So normally you wouldn't have anything here. You would have the illumination <coughs> come in, illuminate, emission will go to the CCD camera. Now we have the grading here, which is represented by a cosine. Um, and it's placed right here in, in the illumination, so it's projected onto the sample. And so the emitted fluorescence with the grading pattern is what's being imaged at the camera, and that's why we see the images with the grading pattern. Um, so modeling this <coughs> now in three dimensions, <coughs> we have the grid being represented by this function at sub k, okay? Uh, this delta z is just an impulse function because this is just a thin grid and it's just, uh, it tells us that it's located at this z location, right? Uh, so this is a function of x, y, s, and z, but it's really varying with x and nothing else. Um, and it, it, because it's imaged here, it's a convolution with the objective lens, points per function. That is multiplied now with the intensity of the object, and this becomes kind of the new object that is being imaged, so that whole function is convolved with the point function of the microscope to create an image on the CCD camera, okay? So, if you remember, in COSM, we just had the convolution of the point function with the object, and now, because of this modification, we have uh, this model. Um, okay, so one thing that is of interest is that uh, we have this uh, projected grid, if you will. So it's not a perfect grid on the focal plane, but it is projected. So there's some blariness there as well. So um, this looks really dark. Uh, in any event, um, the, the idea here is that uh, this is the same model, just uh, written in without the, the independent variables. And there's some three econometric manipulations that you can do because you can rewrite this cosine function in terms of uh, sums of cosines and sines. And um, uh, you, you know, this, this gives an insight on how to uh, reconstruct the uh, actual result from um, these functions because if you have knowledge of these intermediate uh, functions here, G sub C and G sub S, you can do a magnitude computation uh, that will give you approximately back F, which is your sample here. Okay, so remember I mentioned that um, we get three images with the apatom device with different phases. In theory, you could uh, extend these to n images, so you could have more than three phases. You could have phase one, two, all the way in capital N, and you can write these as a, a linear system of equations and um, uh, obtain a solution with a, a least uh, squares method to invert this system, and so then you can um, get uh, the, the the, the solution for the, the underlying object uh, simply by doing this computation. Now, if you pick, um, so this is a general formulation. If you pick the faces, as I mentioned earlier, to be equally spaced over this modulation period, and uh, then this particular solution now um, can be simplified in this form, and if you pick n as 3, then this re the solution of the least squares reduces to the computation that Tony Wilson's group published in 97. So 
this is uh, all consistent with this uh, theory here. Um, so I'm, um, I'm coming to the part, um, I wish the images here <laughs> would look better, uh, but um, the, although this approach works rather well, it can, it, 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 be, it can also become better by doing some deconvolution on these images, because as I mentioned, uh, we are limited to um, what the grid frequency in practice can be used. So this is the same slide as before, just to uh, make the same comment that although we, theoretically we would want to push this grid frequency out, the result is not improving. So we stop uh, usually somewhere here and try to improve with um, uh, deconvolution methods uh, in order to uh, trade off for this compromise uh, due to the reduced signal to noise ratio. Um, so the problem here is this is a nonlinear method, right? There is a modulation and what is being imaged um, is, you know, the result that we get back is the square root, right? of these square differences. So it's uh, not it's not a linear model. So to do deconvolution is really not uh, appropriate because you don't you don't have a, a, a Poisman function that characterizes this structural illumination microscopy um, whole operation. However, um, this group that I didn't give them credit, Lutz Schaefer and Dietwald Schuster, there, we actually just formed a collaboration recently, uh, and uh, I'm using their slides from a, a tutorial that they had uh, given on this topic. Uh, these dark slides are from their talk. Um, they actually did the first initial um, formulation or argued how you can approximate uh, and derive a points per function to characterize the system that um, would improve results um, after you do a, a, a simple filtering approach. So basically, <clears throat> what uh, the question posed here is, well, um, if, you, if you look at this in three dimensions, really there is a, a function that uh, balls, right, that blurs this um, new object. And the question is, what is that function that makes sense? Because if we, if we can characterize that function, then we can use it for the reconstruction. And so, just to kind of skip all these uh, equations, I think, at this point, and come over here, is that there is this um, attenuation along Z that's you see at this profile, and it's this function m of z that um, multiplies the actual points per function of the microscope. So this here is their notation. It's an intensity points per function. It's what I called h in my slides. So you have the regular points per function, and then there is this function that multiplies it. And that, through the mathematics, um, is a, a good approximation as a function that characterizes the point spread function of this whole process. And you see it varies axially. And it, uh, it, it is a function of the illumination, the fact that the grid is actually spreading throughout Z. This is um, a summary slide of this filter, inverse filter, that they propose. So, Based on that points per function in frequency domain, you can write this regularized inverse filter. Um, so you, you're filtering the Fourier transform of data, and then you take the inverse Fourier transform, and there is a regularization parameter here to avoid inversion of small values of the optical transfer function. And um, they've showed that this works really well. So here's a simulation. This is regular wide field image. These images are in the XZ plane. 
right? So kind of similar to my spherical shell, right? You see, imagine the object looks like this, the original object. And when you do structural illumination microscopy, uh, the simple approach, you know, you would get a result like this. So you get improved result, improved axial resolution, but it's not perfect, okay? Because uh, the gray, the grading uh, frequency is not uh, as great as maximum as we need it to be to get back this result. But if you take now this image and do that inverse filter that they propose, deconvolve it, now you can get uh, a superior result. So this is simulation that uh, valid or confirms that this is possible. And then uh, there's a lot of images that they show that this actually works on uh, measurement biological data. And uh, I think we're in the wrong room for the images. Uh, but anyway, because the differences sometimes are subtle and they're hard to see, but you can see here in this little window. What you've seen in this slide is a comparison of raw white field, the convolved white field. And maybe if we can, thank you, yeah, if you can turn that light on. And then over here is structure illumination microscopy and then the convolved structure illumination microscopy. So you see sometimes if you're just doing SIM, only, you don't see a payoff, depending on your object and the lens, you don't see a big payoff over just regular white field. But then the convolving both of them, you see that this has superior result. Uh, here come some uh, overlays, so this is a triple stain, blue, green, and red. Uh, white field, the convolved white field, and this is structural illumination, and then the convolved. Um, it's hard to point at here, there are some acting that you can see a better result. Um, there's a lot of uh, overlay images here. And um, this is in the XC plane up here. You can see that you, know, you get the fine structures like over here, much uh, thinner and better result. But this is the white field, everything is a big blur. You process white field, you get some information. And then over here on top of it. So uh, the structural illumination microscopy makes the inverse problem easier because there's less missing frequencies. So you see that even with a simple uh, non-iterative inverse filter, we can get a result that uh, would require um, a lot of computations if you start with just the white field image. So that's another trade-off um, there, right there, that you know, we can do this with faster computation. So another example here that shows, um, compares this. Uh, here's another one. Um, you can just kind of focus on the thin structures and uh, you know, the little puncta over there to see how they're different. So, um, this is really what I just said, that the, the, the structural illumination makes our problem uh, less imposed, so it's easier to do the inverse imaging problem as compared to starting from the wide field imaging. And um, this um, approach, you know, it's, it promises to uh, give us even more resolution and what we are uh, currently in collaboration with uh, Schaefer and Schuster. We're looking into actually processing the raw images um, rather than uh, the SIM result. And also, we're interested, this is something that I'm interested in, in, do, in correcting for spherical aberrations. So I'm going to show you some simulation results that I performed um, to characterize structural illumination microscopy in the presence of spherical aberrations. So I return to this notion of the fact that this, uh, the grid is projected onto the focal plane. So uh, it's not just a perfect grid image superimposed with the object, but rather it's one that's being uh, attenuated by this function, the m of z, that depends on the light spread function of the lens. And it's also modulated by a cosine. 
So these are simulated results that I generated and uh, presented in, in the recent Photonics West uh, conference. Uh, and that, the idea here was to simulate uh, SIM in the presence of spherical aberration. And here I'm showing two different grid frequencies. Um, and you see that along the z-axis we have projection of this, this is the grid in xy, uh, so it's very only along x, right? Lower frequency, higher frequency. Um, Professor Piesman was trying to draw it the other day, right on the board. And you see that um, we have a region along z where we get this grid projected nicely, but then if you move away from focus uh, significantly, you don't get uh, the grid projected as, um, um, at the same, the same way. You have a deterioration or it becomes out of focus, right? And the higher the grid frequency is, um, the narrower this uh, depth of focus. It's kind of like a depth of focus here where the grid is projected um, undisturbed within, within the, the section. And that's why uh, you know, the higher the frequency, right, in the cosine, the better the optical section, right? Because you're just, you're not modulating the whole specimen, but you're strongly modulating only what's in that focal plane. Um, and if you make the frequency larger, then you're putting in more out of focus light. But this is also the catch-22 because um, you're, um, Having this is more prone to having more noise in the system for reasons that I explained before. Okay, so um, this model that was presented uh, by um, uh, Schaefer and Schuster needs to be modified now to account for all these uh, imaging layers that I talked earlier and the fact that we have spherical aberrations, right? So we did that, in, and the details are in the recent paper. And here's some simulation results that show, um, you know, if you have this structure that's a spherical shell that has two levels of fluorescence, um, you have an image predicted by structural illumination microscopy based on the space invariant model and a depth variant model that uses the strata approach that I presented earlier, and so. We're starting to characterize these for different frequencies and look at the different amounts of spherical aberration due to the refractive index differences in the layers. Um, so this is work in progress. Um, uh, the, what what's interests me is how this change, right, in the result uh, affects uh, the, 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 the quantification or the, the true, the, you know, the results that I showed you before, those beautiful experimental results, right? Um, if they are prone to this kind of aberrations, then surely what we see there, um, it, it has some errors, right? And so what I'm interested in is correcting for yet another uh, source of errors as we move on for imaging thicker and thicker objects, okay? so. Uh, as part of the simulations, you know, we quantify the signal reduction that uh, is observed. So you see here profiles through the raw images, A, B, and C are the grid images of SIM, and here you don't see anything on the projector. But um, this is the final image that you get from structural illumination microscopy to appreciate the fact that there is a huge reduction of signal, right? Because remember, to get this result, it's a combination of these three images, right? And so this black profile is the final result. So you see the signal is much lower, and that's why this image, the images tend to be uh, so poor in the signal to noise ratio. You see it here as well. And you see that the higher the grid frequency, um, you lose the signal right, uh, you know, uh, significantly. You don't see the structure anymore. Um, okay, so, Similar kind of uh, studies here uh, with the noise and with different frequencies to show um, the reduction in the signal. I let me just uh, come here to this part where 
we use the four micrometer test sample. This is measured data using structural illumination microscopy. Um, and the difference in these two profiles is that this is the profile along x, uh, I mean along y, excuse me, from this xy image. You see the little crack that I mentioned on the bead. It's a four micrometer bead and it, um, it it's, if you look at the full width at half max, it's approximately four micrometers. But along z here, you see that uh, we get a bigger spread. So this is comparable at this point to uh, confocal. You know, I, I don't think I put the, I have a confocal image of this bead and I think I forgot to put it here, but it's very comparable to what you would get with the confocal microscope of this uh, bead, for this bead. Um, and then we have the simulated depth variant model to compare uh, with the measurement and you know, we, we are capturing the effects that we see in the measurement. The measurement is the red one here and the simulated depth variant, the blue. So um, more measured grid images and simulated images uh, for different parameters. So these are kind of uh, modeling that I'm interested in in getting fine tuning the model. And I'm going to conclude, I remember I showed you that uh, slide uh, at the end of the first presentation where we had the 200 micrometer thick slice from, through a lamp of a rotund. Uh, and um, here we have uh, as one single image from optical sectioning, uh, I'm just for the comparison, but remember that for in wide field, we collected the whole volume and then we process it with the depth variant EM using six points per functions. And then we, for the same field of view, we inserted the, the apotope device and got the structure illumination microscopy image uh, and, and did a comparison here. So these are the same images and I'm taking profiles along uh, the y-axis uh, to compare. White field is the blue, depth variant EM result is the black, and apotope is the red. So apotope or SIM has a lot of issues with signal to noise ratio. Our result, which is the black, you see the peaks here coincide, so that's uh, good. Here there is some discrepancy with the black and the red peaks. Um, and What's interesting now, this is at the um, very top of the sample, okay? So here's the sample which is thick, right? At this approximately 200 micrometers from top to bottom. And um, looking out here at the top uh, is the first images that I showed you. And then as we move deeper and deeper, what you see here in the structure illumination microscopy is that there is no structure image at all. So this is something that we are investigating. Uh, we, we know that the signal to noise ratio is a problem here. Uh, and we want to, uh, at the same time, we're questioning whether this information is real, you know, or is it just out of focus light and our methodology cannot remove the out of focus light. But um, the, you know, this is still, Preliminary result, but it makes sense that because of the loss of the signal, so this is the profile along the same result, which is the red. So this you're, we're in the noise here, basically. So you can't really get a meaningful signal. The white field is the blue, and processing the white field gives us this black profile <coughs> methodology. So this is a slide that I showed you before, and uh, I'm wrapping it up here. Uh, so I've talked now about 3D microscopy imaging using two methods, computational optical section microscopy and structure illumination microscopy, and I uh, discussed the apodome implementation of SIM by Zeiss. We've shown qualitative agreement of COSM and apodome images, with, uh, and we, we saw that some cell features are better resolved. This is from the previous uh, uh, talk that I showed you those particular cells. The process results with our methodology has larger dynamic range 
in, of intensities and better signal-to-noise <coughs> ratio. Um, and with, of course, COSM, you have to do 3D processing, uh, larger volumes, so that, that computation can essentially be a lot longer than what the, the structural illumination microscopy computation is, which is, you know, online, on the fly, the first result, and then if you do deconvolution, it's again a non-iterative method, linear, so that's faster. So there are pros and cons there at this point. And uh, continuing on with uh, investigations with uh, depth variant uh, modeling approaches and uh, trying to characterize SIM uh, to um, study the effects of the spherical aberrations and we're in the process of um, formulating new ways of using the data from structural illumination microscopy in more meaningful and efficient ways to improve resolution. So I want to thank you for your attention and acknowledge uh, current collaborators on this slide. I guess I, I uh, Lutz uh, Schaefer and Dietmar Schultz were on my earlier collaborator slide, but not on this one, which I forgot to update. And um, I'm looking for uh, graduate research assistants, so if you are interested in this kind of work or you know people that might be, uh, uh, please have them contact me. So, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, any questions? Good, everything was crystal clear. <laughs> right now, uh, yeah. Um, so you showed the, the commercial product that pretty much, uh, you know, is uh, uh, available uh, and allows to compute confocal light images out of, you know, regular light. You know, right. But uh, the, the question is, with the software, with the software cost, how much cost effective is it compared to the cost of the confocal light? Sure. So the the uh, the attachment, the device, right? That cost about twenty two thousand dollars. And uh, if you want, what Zeiss does, if you want to purchase their deconvolution, uh, you have to buy that separately, and that's another twenty thousand, let's say. So if one has a regular person's microscope and wants to include the best, well, you could get, you could spend the 22,000 and get the, the one version of structural illumination. If you want to do the additional software, it will be $42,000. So, uh, that's still a lot cheaper than the Confocal, right? And if you are interested in doing, um, you know, imaging live cells fast, um, this would be a faster data acquisition still considerably because it's not as garnish. Even though you have to get multiple frames depending on you know if you're averaging or or how many phases you're gonna use. But with Apatom they only use three uh, phases on the grid, so it's three uh, three per frame, and then if you're averaging, you know, by five, obviously then you get 15 images for one frame, so it does, the number of images do increase. Uh, but again, you know, you don't necessarily need to um, take 128 or 200 focal sections. You know, you can, the, the good thing about it is that you can do localized imaging, you know, if there's something that you're really at a certain location that you're interested in, you can actually go and query that and, and just get that. So, what was the Apotome? Apotome. 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 Yeah. Which is from Greek. <coughs>
Does there more questions? Yeah, is there any more questions? Um. <laughs> <laughs>